Section 18 of Catherine de' Medici by Honor de Balzac. Translated by Catherine Prescott Warmly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2 The Secrets of the Ruggieri. 1. The Court under Charles the Ninth. Between eleven o'clock and midnight, toward the end of October 1573, two Italians, Florentines and brothers, Albert de Gondi, Duc de Retz, and Albert de Gondi, Duc de Retz, a Marshal of France, and Charles de Gondi Latour, Grand Master of the Robes of Charles the Ninth, were sitting on the roof of a house in the Rue Saint Honneur, at the edge of a gutter. This gutter was one of those stone channels which in former days were constructed below the roofs of houses to receive the rainwater, discharging it at regular intervals through those long gargoyles carved in the shape of fantastic animals with gaping mouths. In spite of the zeal with which our present general pulls down and demolishes venerable buildings, there still existed many of these projecting gutters until, quite recently, an ordinance of the police as to water conduits compelled them to disappear. But even so, a few of these carved gargoyles still remain, chiefly in the Quartier Saint-Antoine, where low rents and values hinder the building of new stories under the eaves of the roofs. It certainly seems strange that two personages invested with such important offices should be playing the part of cats. But whosoever will burrow into the historic treasures of those days, when personal interests jostled and thwarted each other around the throne till the whole political centre of France was like a skein of tangled thread, will readily understand that the two Florentines were cats indeed and very much in their places, in their gutter. Their devotion to the person of the Queen Mother, Catherine de' Medici, who had brought them to the court of France, and foisted them into their high offices, compelled them not to recoil before any of the consequences of their intrusion. But to explain how and why these courtiers were thus perched, it is necessary to relate a scene which had taken place an hour earlier, not far from this very gutter, in that beautiful brown room of the Louvre, all that now remains to us of the apartments of Henri II, in which, after supper, the courtiers had been paying court to the two queens, Catherine de' Medici and Elizabeth of Austria, and to their son and husband, King Charles the Ninth. In those days the majority of the burghers and great lords supped at six, or at seven o'clock, but the more refined and elegant supped at eight, or even nine. This repast was the dinner of today. Many persons erroneously believed that etiquette was invented by Louis the Fourteenth. On the contrary, it was introduced into France by Catherine de Medici, who made it so severe that the Connetable de Montmorency had more difficulty in obtaining permission to enter the court of the Louvre on horseback than in winning his sword. Moreover, that unheard-of distinction was granted to him only on account of his great age. Etiquette, which was, it is true, slightly relaxed under the first two Bourbon kings, took an oriental form under the great monarch, for it was introduced from the Eastern Empire, which derived it from Persia. In 1573, few persons had the right to enter the courtyard of the Louvre with their servants and torches. Under Louis the Fourteenth, the coaches of none but dukes and peers were allowed to pass under the peristyle. Moreover, the cost of obtaining entrance after supper to the royal apartments was very heavy. The Marquis de Retz, whom we have just seen perched on a gutter, offered on one occasion a thousand crowns of that day, six thousand francs of our present money, to the usher of the king's cabinet, to be allowed to speak to Henri the Third, on a day when he was not on duty. To a historian who knows the truth, it is laughable to see the well-known picture of the courtyard at Blois, in which the artist has introduced a courtier on horseback. On the present occasion, therefore, none but the most eminent personages in the kingdom were in the royal apartments. The queen, Elizabeth of Austria, and her mother-in-law, Catherine de' Medici, were seated together on the left of the fireplace. On the other side sat the king, buried in an armchair, affecting a lethargy consequent on digestion, for he had just supped like a prince returned from hunting. Possibly he was seeking to avoid conversation in presence of so many persons who were spies upon his thoughts. The courtiers stood erect and uncovered at the end of the room. Some talked in a low voice, others watched 
the king, awaiting the bestowal of a look or a word. Occasionally one was called up by the queen mother, who talked with him for a few moments. Another risked saying a word to the king, who replied with either a nod or a brief sentence. A German nobleman, the Comte de Salerne, stood at the corner of the fireplace behind the young queen, the granddaughter of Charles V, whom he had accompanied into France. Near to her on a stool sat her lady of honour, the Comtesse de Fiesque, a Strozzi, and a relation of Catherine de' Medici. The beautiful Madame de Sauve, a descendant of Jacques Coeur, mistress of the King of Navarre, then of the King of Poland, and lastly of the Duc d'Alencon, had been invited to supper, and she stood like the rest of the court, her husband's rank, that of Secretary of State, giving her no right to be seated. Behind these two ladies stood the two Gondis, talking to them. They alone, of this dismal assembly, were smiling. Albert Gondi, now Duc de Rice, Marshal of France, and gentleman of the bedchamber, had been deputed to marry the queen by proxy at Spire. In the first line of courtiers nearest to the king stood the Marechal de Tavannes, who was present on court business. Neuf Ville de Villeroy, one of the ablest bankers of the period, who laid the foundation of the great house of that name, Birago and Kiverni, gentleman of a queen mother, who, knowing her preference for her son Henri, the brother whom Charles the Ninth regarded as an enemy, attached themselves especially to him. Then Strozzi, Catherine's cousin, and finally a number of great lords, among them the old Cardinal de Lorraine and his nephew, the young Duc de Guise, who were held at a distance by the king and his mother. These two leaders of the Holy Alliance, and later of the League, founded in conjunction with Spain a few years earlier, affected the submission of servants who were only waiting an opportunity to make themselves masters. Catherine and Charles the Ninth watched each other with close attention. At this gloomy court, as gloomy as the room in which it was held, each individual had his or her own reasons for being sad or thoughtful. The young Queen Elizabeth, was a prey to the tortures of jealousy, and could ill disguise them, though she smiled upon her husband, whom she passionately adored, good and pious woman that she was. Marie Touchet, the only mistress Charles the Ninth ever had, and to whom he was loyally faithful, had lately returned from the Chateau de Fayet in Dauphin, whither she had gone to give birth to a child. She brought back to Charles the Ninth a son, his only son, Charles de Valois, first Comte d'Auvin, and afterwards Duc de Goulême. The poor queen, in addition to the mortification of her abandonment, now endured the pang of knowing that her rival had borne a son to her husband, while she had brought him only a daughter. And these were not her only troubles and disillusions, for Catherine de' Medici, who had seemed her friend in the first instance, now out of policy favoured her betrayal, preferring to serve the mistress rather than the wife of the king, for the following reason. When Charles the Ninth openly avowed his passion for Marie Touchet, Catherine showed favour to the girl in the interests of her own desire for domination. Marie Touchet, who was very young when brought to court, came at an age when all the noblest sentiments are predominant. She loved the king for himself alone. Frightened at the fate to which ambition had led the Duchesse de Valentinois, better known as Diane de Poitiers, she dreaded the Queen Mother, and greatly preferred her simple happiness to grandeur. Perhaps she thought that lovers as young as the King and herself could never struggle successfully against the Queen Mother. As the daughter of Jean Touchet, Sieur de Beauvais, and Quillard, she was born between the burgher class and the lower nobility. She had none of the inborn ambitions of the Pisseleux and saint Valier, girls of rank who battled for their families with the hidden weapons of love. Marie Touchet, without family or friends, spared Catherine de' Medici all antagonism with her son's mistress. The daughter of a great house would have been her rival. Jean Touchet, the father, one of the finest wits of the time, a man to whom poets dedicated their works, wanted nothing at court. Marie, a young girl without connections, intelligent and well-educated, and also simple and artless, whose desires would probably never be aggressive to the royal power, suited the Queen Mother admirably. In short, 
she made the parliament recognize the son to whom marie touchet had just given birth in the month of april and she allowed him to take the title of comte d'auvergne assuring charles the ninth that she would leave the boy her personal property the counties of auvergne and la Raguée. at a later period marguerite de valois queen of navarre contested this legacy after she was queen of france and the parliament annulled it but later still louis the thirteenth out of respect for the valois blood indemnified the comte d'auvergne by the gift of the duchy of Agulem. catherine had already given marie touchet who asked nothing of the manor of belleville on a state close to vincent which carried no title and thither she went whenever the king hunted and spent the night at the castle it was in this gloomy fortress that charles the ninth passed the greater part of his last years ending his life there according to some historians as louis the twelfth had ended his the queen mother kept close watch upon her son all the occupations of his personal life outside of politics were reported to her the king had begun to look upon his mother as an enemy but the kind intentions she expressed toward his son diverted his suspicions for a time catherine's motives in this matter were never understood by queen elizabeth who according to Brantom, was one of the gentlest queens that ever reigned who never did harm or even gave pain to any one and was careful to read her prayer book secretly but this single-minded princess began at last to see the precipices yawning around the throne a dreadful discovery which might indeed have made her quail it was some such remembrance no doubt that led her to say to one of her ladies after the death of the king in reply to a condolence that she had no son and could not therefore be regent and queen mother ah i thank god that i have no son i know well what would have happened my poor son would have been despoiled and wronged like the king my husband and i should have been the cause of it god had mercy on the state he has done all for the best this princess whose portrait Brantome thinks he draws by saying that her complexion was as beautiful and delicate as the ladies of her suite were charming and agreeable and that her figure was fine though rather short was of little account at her own court suffering from a double grief her saddened attitude added another gloomy tone to a scene which most young queens less cruelly injured might have enlivened the pious elizabeth proved at this crisis that the qualities which are the shining glory of women in the ordinary ways of life can be fatal to a sovereign a princess able to occupy herself with other things besides her prayer book might have been a useful helper to charles the ninth who found no prop to lean on either in his wife or in his mistress the queen mother as she sat there in that brown room was closely observing the king who during supper had exhibited a boisterous good humour which he felt to be assumed in order to mask some intention against her this sudden gaiety contrasted too vividly with the struggle of mind he endeavoured to conceal by his eagerness in hunting and by an almost maniacal toil at his forge where he spent many hours in hammering iron and catherine was not deceived by it without being able even to guess which of the statesmen about the king was employed to prepare or negotiate it for charles the ninth contrived to mislead his mother's spies catherine felt no doubt whatever that some scheme for her overthrow was being planned the unlooked-for presence of tavan who arrived at the same time as strozzi whom she herself had summoned gave her food for thought strong in the strength of her political combination catherine was above the reach of circumstances but she was powerless against some hidden violence as many persons are ignorant of the actual state of public affairs then so complicated by the various parties that distracted france the leaders of which had each their private interests to carry out it is necessary to describe in a few words the perilous game in which the queen mother was now engaged to show catherine de medici in a new light is in fact the root and stock of our present history two words explain this woman so curiously interesting to study a woman whose influence has left such deep impressions upon france these words are power and astrology exclusively ambitious catherine de medici had no other passion than that of power superstitious and fatalistic like so many superior men 
she had no sincere belief except in occult sciences. Unless this double mainspring is known, the conduct of Catherine de' Medici will remain forever misunderstood. As we picture her faith in judicial astrology, the light will fall upon two personages who are in fact the philosophical subjects of this study. There lived a man for whom Catherine cared more than for any of her children. His name was Cosmo Ruggiero. He lived in a house belonging to her, the Hôtel de Soissons. She made him her supreme adviser. It was his duty to tell her whether the stars ratified the advice and judgment of her ordinary counsellors. Certain remarkable antecedents warranted the power which Cosmo Ruggiero retained over his mistress to her last hour. One of the most learned men of the 16th century was physician to Lorenzo de' Medici, Duke d'Urbino, Catherine's father. This physician was called Ruggiero the Elder, Vecchio Ruggiero and Roger Lancien, and Roger Lancien in the French authors who have written on alchemy, to distinguish him from his two sons, Lorenzo Ruggiero, called the Great by Kabbalistic writers, and Cosmo Ruggiero, Catherine's astrologer, also called Roger, by several French historians. In France, it was the custom to pronounce the name in general as Ruggieri. Ruggiero the Elder was so highly valued by the Medici that the two dukes, Cosmo and Lorenzo, stood godfathers to his two sons. He cast in concert with the famous mathematician Basilio the horoscope of Catherine's nativity in his official capacity as mathematician, astrologer, and physician to the house of Medici three offices which are often confounded. At the period of which we write, the occult sciences were studied with an ardour that may surprise the incredulous minds of our own age, which is supremely analytical. Perhaps such minds may find in this historical sketch the dawn, or rather the germ, of the positive sciences which have flowered in the nineteenth century, though without the poetic grandeur given to them by the audacious seekers of the sixteenth, who, instead of using them solely for mechanical industries, magnified art and fertilized thought by their means. The protection universally given to occult sciences by the sovereigns of those days was justified by the noble creations of many inventors, who, starting in quest of the great work, the so-called Philosopher's Stone, attained to astonishing results. At no period were the sovereigns of the world more eager for the study of these mysteries. The Fuggers of Augsburg, in whom all modern luculuses will recognize their princes and all bankers their masters were gifted with powers of calculation it would be difficult to surpass well those practical men who loaned the funds of all europe to the sovereigns of the sixteenth century as deeply in debt as the kings of the present day those illustrious guests of charles v were sleeping partners in the crucibles of paracelsus at the beginning of the sixteenth century Ruggiero the Elder was the head of that secret university from which issued the Cardin, the Nostradamuses, and the Agrippas, all in their turn physicians of the house of Valois, also the astronomers, astrologers, and alchemists who surrounded the princes of Christendom, and were more especially welcomed and protected in France by Catherine de' Medici. In the nativity drawn by Basilio and Ruggiero the Elder, the principal events of Catherine's life were foretold with a correctness which is quite disheartening for those who deny the power of occult science. This horoscope predicted the misfortunes which during the siege of Florence imperiled the beginning of her life. Also her marriage with the son of the King of France, the unexpected succession of that son to his father's throne, the birth of her children, their number, and the fact that three of her sons would be kings in succession, that two of her daughters would be queens, and that all of them were destined to die without posterity. This prediction was so fully realised that many historians have assumed that it was written after the events. It is well known that Nostradamus took to the Chateau de Chaumont, whither Catherine went after the conspiracy of La Renaudie, a woman who possessed the faculty of reading the future. Now, during the reign of Francois II, while the Queen had with her four sons, all young and in good health, and before the marriage of her daughter Elizabeth with Philip the Second, King of Spain, or that of her daughter Marguerite with Henri de Bourbon, King of Navarre, afterward Henri the Fourth, Nostradamus and this woman reiterated the circumstances formerly predicted in the famous nativity. This woman, 
who was no doubt gifted with second sight, and who belonged to the great school of seekers of the great work, though the particulars of her life and name are lost to history, stated that the last crowned child would be assassinated. Having placed the Queen Mother in front of a magic mirror, in which was reflected a wheel, and the several spokes of which were the faces of her children, the sorceress set the wheel revolving, and Catherine counted the number of revolutions which it made. Each revolution was for each son one year of his reign. Henri the Fourth was also put upon the wheel, which then made twenty-four rounds, and the woman, some historians have said it was a man, told the frightened queen that Henri de Bourbon would be king of France and reign that number of years. From that time forth, Catherine de' Medici vowed a mortal hatred to the man whom she knew would succeed the last of her Valois sons, who was to die assassinated. Anxious to know what her own death would be, she was warned to beware of Saint-Germain, supposing, therefore, that she would be either put to death or imprisoned in a chateau de Saint-Germain, she would never so much as put her foot there, although that residence was far more convenient for her political plans, owing to its proximity to Paris, than the other castles to which she retreated with the king during the troubles. When she was taken suddenly ill, a few days after the murder of the Duc de Guise at Blois, she asked the name of the bishop who came to assist her. Being told it was Saint-Germain, she cried out, I am dead, and did actually die on the morrow, having, moreover, lived the exact number of years given to her by all her horoscopes. These predictions, which were known to the Cardinal de Lorrain, who regarded them as witchcraft, were now in process of realisation. Francois the Second had reigned his two revolutions of the wheel, and Charles the Ninth was now making his last turn. If Catherine said the strange words which history has attributed to her when her son Henri stood for Poland, you will soon return, they must be set down to her faith in occult science and not to the intention of poisoning Charles the Ninth. Many other circumstances corroborated Catherine's faith in the occult sciences. The night before the tournament at which Henri the Second was killed, Catherine saw the fatal blow in a dream. Her astrological council, then composed of Nostradamus and the two Ruggieri, had already predicted to her the death of the king. History has recorded the efforts made by Catherine to persuade her husband not to enter the lists. The prognostic and the dream produced by the prognostic were verified. The memoirs of the day relate another fact that was no less singular. The courier who announced the victory of Montcontour arrived in the night after riding with such speed that he killed three horses. The queen mother was awakened to receive the news to which she replied, I knew it already. In fact, as Brantom relates, she had told of her son's triumph the evening before and narrated several circumstances of the battle. The astrologer of the House of Bourbon predicted that the youngest of all the princes descended from Saint-Louis, son of Antoine de Bourbon, would ascend the throne of France. This prediction, related by Sully, was accomplished in the precise terms of the horoscope, which led Henri IV to say that by dint of lying, these people sometimes hit the truth, however that may be. If most of the great minds of the epoch believed in this vast science, called magic by the masters of judicial astrology and sorcery by the public, they were justified in doing so by the fulfilment of horoscopes. It was for the use of Cosmo Ruggiero, a mathematician, astronomer, and astrologer, that Catherine de' Medici erected the tower behind the Al Orble, all that now remains of the Hôtel de Soissons. Cosmo Ruggiero possessed, like confessors, a mysterious influence, the possession of which, like them again, sufficed him. He cherished an ambitious thought superior to all vulgar ambitions. This man, whom dramatists and romance writers depict as a juggler, owned the rich abbey of Saint-Maille in Lower Brittany, and refused many high ecclesiastical dignities. The gold which the superstitious passions of the age poured into his coffers sufficed for his secret enterprise, and the queen's hand stretched above his head preserved every hair of it from danger. End of section 18
Section 19 of Catherine de' Medici by Honor de Balzac, translated by Catherine Prescott Warmany. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 2, Chapter 2 Schemes Against Schemes. The thirst for power which consumes to the Queen Mother, her desire for dominion, was so great that in order to retain it, she had, as we have seen, allied herself to the geese. Allied herself to the geezers those enemies of the throne, to keep the reins of power now obtained within her hands. She was using every means, even to the sacrifice of her friends and that of her children. This woman, of whom one of her enemies said at her death, it is more than a queen, it is monarchy itself that has died. This woman could not exist without the intrigues of government, as a gambler can live only by the emotions of play. Although she was an Italian of the voluptuous race of the Medici, the Calvinists who calumniated her never accused her of having a lover. A great admirer of the maxim divide to reign, she had learned the art of perpetually pitting one force against another. No sooner had she grasped the reins of power than she was forced to keep up dissensions in order to neutralize the strength of two rival houses and thus save the crown. Catherine invented the game of political seesaw, since imitated by all princes who find themselves in a like situation by instigating first the Calvinists against the Guises, and then the Guises against the Calvinists. Next, after pitting the two religions against each other in the heart of the nation, Catherine instigated the Duc d'Anjou against his brother Charles the Ninth. After neutralizing events by opposing them to one another, she neutralized men by holding the thread of all their interests in her hands. But so fearful a game, which needs the head of a Louis XI to play it, draws down inevitably the hatred of all parties upon the player, who condemns himself forever to be in necessity of conquering, for one lost game will turn every selfish interest into an enemy. The greater part of the reign of Charles the Ninth witnessed the triumph of the domestic policy of this astonishing woman. What adroit persuasion must Catherine have employed to have obtained the command of the armies for the Duc d'Anjou under a young and brave king, thirsting for glory? capable of military achievement, generous, and in presence, too, of the Connetable de Montmorency. In the eyes of the statesmen of Europe, the Duc d'Anjou had all the honours of the saint Bartholomew, and Charles the Ninth all the odium. After inspiring the king with a false and secret jealousy of his brother, she used that passion to wear out, by the intrigues of fraternal jealousy, the really noble qualities of Charles the Ninth. Cipierre, the king's first governor, and Amiot, his first tutor, had made him so great a man, they had paved the way for so noble a reign, that the Queen Mother began to hate her son as soon as she found reason to fear the loss of the power she had so slowly and so painfully obtained. On these general grounds, most historians have believed that Catherine de' Medici felt a preference for Henri III, but her conduct at the period of which we are now writing proves the absolute indifference of her heart toward all her children. When the Duc d'Anjou went to reign in Poland, Catherine was deprived of the instrument by which she had worked to keep the king's passions occupied in domestic intrigues, which neutralized his energy in other directions. She then set up the conspiracy of La Mole and Coquenard, in which her youngest son, the Duc d'Alencon, afterwards Duc d'Anjou on the accession of Henri III, took part, lending himself very willingly to his mother's wishes, and displaying an ambition much encouraged by his sister Marguerite then Queen of Navarre. This secret conspiracy had now reached the point to which Catherine sought to bring it. Its object was to put the young duke and his brother-in-law, the King of Navarre, at the head of the Calvinists, to seize the person of Charles the Ninth and imprison that king without an heir, leaving the throne to the Duc d'Alencon, whose intention it was to establish Calvinism as the religion of France. Calvin, as we have already said, had obtained a few days before his death the reward he had so deeply coveted. The Reformation was now called Calvinism in his honour. If La Laboureur and other sensible writers had not already proved that La Mole and Coquenard, arrested fifty nights after the day on which our present history begins, and beheaded the following April, even, we say, if it had not been made historically clear that these men were the victims of the Queen Mother's policy, the part which Cosmo Ruggiero took in this affair would go far to show but she secretly directed their enterprise. Ruggiero, against whom the king had suspicions, 
and for whom he cherished a hatred the motives of which we are about to explain was included in the prosecution he admitted having given to la mole a wax figure representing the king which was pierced through the heart by two needles this method of casting spells constituted a crime which in those days was punished by death it presents one of the most startling and infernal images of hatred that humanity could invent it pictures admirably the magnetic and terrible working in the occult world of a constant malevolent desire surrounding the person doomed to death the effects of which on the person are exhibited by the figure of wax the law in those days thought and thought justly that a desire to which an actual form was given should be regarded as a crime of le majeste charles the ninth demanded the death of ruggiero catherine more powerful than her son obtained from the parliament through the young councillor lecamu a commutation of the sentence and cosmo was sent to the galleys the following year on the death of the king he was pardoned by a decree of henri the third who restored his pension and received him at court but to return now to the moment of which we are writing catherine had by this time struck so many blows on the heart of her son that he was eagerly desirous of casting off her yoke during the absence of marie duchet charles the ninth deprived of his usual occupation had taken to observing everything about him he cleverly set traps for the persons in whom he trusted most in order to test their fidelity he spied on his mother's actions concealing from her all knowledge of his own implying for this deception the evil qualities she had fostered in him consumed by a desire to blot out the horror excited in france by the saint pantolomu he busied himself actively in public affairs he presided at the council and tried to seize the reins of government by well-laid schemes though the queen mother endeavoured to check these attempts of her son by employing all the means of influence over his mind which her maternal authority and a long habit of domineering gave her his rush into distrust was so vehement that he went too far the first bound ever to return from it the day on which his mother's speech to the king of poland was reported to him charles the ninth conscious of his failing health conceived the most horrible suspicions and when such thoughts take possession of the mind of a son and a king nothing can remove them in fact on his deathbed at the moment when he confided his wife and daughter to henri the fourth he began to put the latter on his guard against catherine so that she cried out passionately endeavouring to silence him do not say that monsieur although charles the ninth never ceased to show her the outward respect of which she was so tenacious that she would never call the kings her sons anything but monsieur the queen mother had detected in her son's manner during the last few months an ill-disguised purpose of vengeance but clever indeed must be the man who counted on taking catherine unawares she held ready in her hand at this moment the conspiracy of the duc d'alencon and la mole in order to counteract by another fraternal struggle the efforts charles the ninth was making toward emancipation but before employing this means she wanted to remove his distrust of her which would render impossible their future reconciliation for was he likely to restore power to the hands of a mother whom he thought capable of poisoning him she felt herself at this moment in such serious danger that she had sent for strozzi a relation and a soldier noted for his promptitude of action she took counsel in secret with birago and the two gondis and never did she so frequently consult her oracle cosmo ruggiero as at the present crisis though the habit of dissimulation together with advancing age had given the queen mother that well-known abbess face with its haughty and macerated mask expressionlessness yet full of depth inscrutable yet vigilant remarked by all who have studied her portrait the courtiers now observed some clouds on her icy countenance no sovereign was ever so imposing as this woman from the day when she succeeded in restraining the guises after the death of francois the second her black velvet cap made with a point upon the forehead for she never relinquished her widow's mourning seemed a species of feminine cow around a cold imperious face to which however she knew how to give at the right moment a seductive italian charm catherine de medici was so well made that she was accused of inventing side saddle to show the shape of her legs which were absolutely perfect women followed her example in this respect throughout europe which even then took its fashions from france those who desire to bring this grand figure before their minds will find that the scene now taking place in the brown hall of the louvre 
presents it in a striking aspect. The two queens, different in spirit, in beauty, in death, are now estranged. One naive and thoughtful, the other thoughtful and gravely abstracted, were far too preoccupied to think of giving the order awaited by the courtiers for the amusements of the evening. The carefully concealed drama, playing for the last six months by the mother and son, was more than suspected by many of the courtiers, but the Italians were watching it with special anxiety. Catherine's failure involved their ruin. During this evening, Charles the Ninth, weary with the day's hunting, looked to be forty years old. He had reached the last stages of the malady of which he died, the symptoms of which were such that many reflecting persons were justified in thinking that he was poisoned. According to Detou, the Tacitus of the Valois, the surgeons found suspicious spots, a causa incognita reperti livores, on his body. Moreover, his funeral was even more neglected than that of Francois the Second. The body was conducted from the Saint Lazare to Saint Denis by Brantome, and a few archers of the guard under command of the Comte de Solene. This circumstances, coupled with the supposed hatred of the mother to the son, may or may not give colour to de Thou's supposition that it proves how little affection Catherine felt for any of her children, a want of feeling which may be explained by her implicit faith in the predictions of judicial astrology. This woman was unable to feel affection for the instruments which were destined to fail her. Henri the Third was the last king under whom her reign of power was to last. That was the sole consideration of her heart and mind. In these days, however, we can readily believe that Charles the Ninth died a natural death. His excesses, his manner of life, the sudden development of his faculties, his last spasmodic attempt to recover the reins of power, his desire to live, the abuse of his vital strength, his final sufferings and last pleasures, all prove to an impartial mind that he died of consumption, a disease scarcely studied at that time and very little understood, the symptoms of which might, not unnaturally, lead Charles the Ninth to believe himself poisoned. The real poison which his mother gave him was in the fatal counsels of the courtiers whom she placed about him men who led him to waste his intellectual as well as his physical vigour, thus bringing on a malady which is purely fortuitous and not constitutional. Under these harrowing circumstances, Charles the Ninth displayed a gloomy majesty of demeanour, which was not unbecoming to a king. The solemnity of his secret thoughts was reflected on his face, the olive tones of which he inherited from his mother. This ivory pallor, so fine by candlelight, so suited to the expression of melancholy thought, brought out vigorously the fire of the blue-black eyes, which gazed from their thick and heavy lids with the keen perception our fancy lends to kings, the colour being a cloak for dissimulation. Those eyes were terrible, especially from the movement of their brows, which he could raise or lower at will on his bald, high forehead. His nose was broad and long, thick at the end the nose of a lion. His ears were large, his hair sandy, his lips blood-red, like those of all consumptives, the upper lip thin and sarcastic, the lower one firm and full enough to give an impression of the noblest qualities of the heart. The wrinkles of his brow, the youth of which was killed by dreadful cares, inspired the strongest interest. Remorse, caused by the uselessness of the Saint Bartholomew, Counted for some, but there were two others on that face which would have been eloquent indeed to any student whose premature genius had led him to divine had led him to divine the principles of modern physiology. These wrinkles made a deeply indented furrow going from each cheekbone to each corner of the mouth, revealing the inward efforts of an organization wearied by the toil of thought and the violent excitements of the body. Charles the Ninth was worn out. If policy did not stifle remorse in the breasts of those who sit beneath the purple, the Queen Mother, looking at her own work, would surely have felt it. Had Catherine foreseen the effect of her intrigues upon her son, would she have recoiled from them? What a fearful spectacle was this! A king born vigorous, and now so feeble, a mind powerfully tempered, shaken by distrust. A man clothed with authority, conscious of no support, 
a firm mind brought to pass of having lost all confidence in itself. His warlike valour had changed by degrees to ferocity, his discretion to deceit. The refined and delicate love of a Valois was now a mere quenchless thirst for pleasure. This perverted and misjudged great man, with all the many facets of a noble soul worn out, a king without power, a generous heart without a friend, dragged hither and thither by a thousand conflicting intrigues, presented the melancholy spectacle of a youth only twenty-four years old, disillusioned of life, distrusting everybody and everything, now resolving to risk all, even his life, on a last effort. For some time past, he had fully understood his royal mission, his power, his resources, and the obstacles which his mother opposed to the pacification of the kingdom. But, alas, this light now burned in a shattered lantern. Two men, whom Charles the Ninth loved sufficiently to protect under circumstances of great danger, Jean Chapelain, his physician, whom he saved from the saint Bartholomew, and Amboise Paré, with whom he went to dine when Paré's enemies were accusing him of intending to poison the king, had arrived this evening in haste from the provinces, recalled by the queen mother. Both were watching their master anxiously. A few courtiers spoke to them in a low voice. But the men of science made guarded answers, carefully concealing the fatal verdict which was in their minds. Every now and then the king would raise his heavy eyelids and give his mother a furtive look, which he tried to conceal from those about him. Suddenly he sprang up and stood before the fireplace. Monsieur de Kivagny, he said abruptly, why do you keep the title of Chancellor of Anjou and Poland? Are you in our service? or in that of our brother. I am all yours, sire, replied Kiverny, bowing low. Then come to me tomorrow. I intend to send you to Spain. Very strange things are happening at the court of Madrid, gentlemen. The king looked at his wife and flung himself back into his chair. Strange things are happening everywhere, said the Marquis de Tavannes, one of the friends of the king's youth, in a low voice. The king rose again and led this companion of his youthful pleasures apart into the embouchure of the window at the corner of the room, saying, when they were out of hearing, I want you. You remain here when the others go. I shall not deny whether you are for me or against me. Don't look astonished. I am about to burst my bonds. My mother is the cause of all the evil about me. Three months hence I shall be king indeed, or dead. Silence if you value your life. You will have my secret. You and Salerne and Villeroy only. If it is betrayed, it will be by one of you three. Don't keep near me. Go and pay your court to my mother. Tell her I am dying and that you don't regret it, for I am only a poor creature. The king was leaning on the shoulder of his favourite and pretending to tell him of his ailments in order to mislead the inquisitive eyes about him. Then, not wishing to make his aversion too visible, he went up to his wife and mother and talked with them, calling Birago to their side. Just then Pinard, one of the secretaries of state, glided like an eel through the door and along the wall until he reached the queen mother, in whose ear he said a few words, to which she replied by an affirmative sign. The king did not ask his mother the meaning of this conference, but he returned to his seat and kept silence, darting terrible looks of anger and suspicion all about him. This little circumstance seemed of enormous consequence in the eyes of the courtiers, and in truth so marked an exercise of power by the queen mother, without reference to the king, was like a drop of water overflowing the cup. Queen Elizabeth and the Comtesse de Fiesca now retired, but the king paid no attention to their movements, though the queen mother rose and attended her daughter-in-law to the door, after which the courtiers, understanding that their presence was unwelcome, took their leave. By ten o'clock, no one remained in the hall but a few intimates, the two Gondis, Tavan, Solern, Birago, the king, and the queen mother. The king sat plunged in the blackest melancholy. The silence was oppressive. Catherine seemed embarrassed. She wished to leave the room and waited for the king to escort her to the door, but he still continued obstinately lost in thought. At last she rose to bid him good night and Charles the Ninth was forced to do likewise. As she took his arm and made a few steps toward the door, she bent to his ear and whispered, Monsieur, 
I have important things to say to you. Passing a mirror on her way, she glanced into it, and made a sign with her eyes to the two Gondis, which escaped the king's notice, for he was at the moment exchanging looks of intelligence with the Comte de Salin and Villeroy. Tavanne was thoughtful. Sire, said the latter, coming out of his reverie, I think you are royally annoyed. Don't you ever amuse yourself? Vive Dieu! Have you forgotten the times when we used to vagabondize about the streets at night? Ah, those were the good old times, said the king with a sigh. Why not bring them back? said Birago, glancing significantly at the Gondis as he took his leave. Yes, I always think of those days with pleasure, said Albert de Gondi, Duc de Retz. I'd like to see you on the roofs once more, Monsieur le Duc, remarked Tavan. Damned Italian cat. I wish he might break his neck, he added in a whisper to the king. I don't know which of us could climb the quickest in these days, replied de Gondi, but the one thing I do know, that neither of us fears to die. Well, sire, will you start upon a frolic in the streets to-night, as you did in the days of your youth? said the other Gondi, master of the wardrobe. The days of his youth. So at twenty-four years of age the wretched king seemed no longer young to any one, not even to his flatterers. Tavan and his master now reminded each other, like two schoolboys, of certain pranks they had played in Paris, and the evening's amusement was soon arranged. The two Italians, challenged to climb roofs and jump from one to another across alleys and streets, wagered that they would follow the king wherever he went. They and Tavant went off to change their clothes. The Comte de Solern, left alone with the king, looked at him in amazement. Though the worthy German, filled with compassion for the hapless position of the king of France, was honour and fidelity itself, he was certainly not quick of perception. Charles the Ninth, surrounded by hostile persons, unable to trust any one, not even his wife, who had been guilty of some indiscretions, unaware as she was that his mother and his servants were his enemies, had been fortunate enough to find in Monsieur de Solern a faithful friend in whom he could place entire confidence. Tavan and Villeroy were trusted with only a part of the king's secrets. The Comte de Solern alone knew the whole of the plan, which he was now about to carry out. This devoted friend was also useful to his master in possessing a book of discreet and affectionate followers who blindly obeyed his orders. He commanded a detachment of the archers of the guards, and for the last few days he had been sifting out the men who were faithfully attached to the king in order to make a company of tried men when the need came. The king took thought of everything. Why are you surprised, Solan? he said. You know very well I need a pretext to be out tonight. It is true I have Madame de Belleville, but this is better, for who knows whether my mother does not hear of all that goes on in Maurice. Monsieur de Solern, who was to follow the king, asked if he might not take a few of his Germans to patrol the streets, and Charles consented. At eleven o'clock the king, who was now very gay, set forth with his three courtiers, namely Tavan and the two Gondis. I'll go and take my little Marie by surprise, said Charles the Knight to Tavan, as we pass through the Rue de l'Autruche. That street being on the way to the Rue Saint-Honneur, it would have been strange indeed for the king to pass the house of his love without stopping. Looking out for a chance of mischief, a belated burgher to frighten or a watchman to thrash, the king went along with his nose in the air, watching all the lighted windows to see what was happening and striving to hear the conversations. But alas, he found his good city of Paris in a state of deplorable tranquillity. Suddenly, as he passed the house of a perfumer named Ron, who supplied the court, the king, noticing a strong light from a window in the roof, was seized by one of those apparently hasty inspirations which to some minds suggest a previous intention. This perfumer was strongly suspected of curing rich uncles who thought themselves ill. Court laid at his door the famous elixir of inheritance, and even accused him of poisoning Jeanne d'Albroy, mother of Henri of Navarre, who was buried, in spite of Charles the Ninth's positive order, without a head being opened. For the last two months, the king had sought some way of sending a spy into René's laboratory, where, as he was well aware, Cosmo Ruggiero spent much time. The king intended, if anything suspicious were discovered, to proceed in the matter alone, without the assistance of the police or law, with whom, as he well knew, his mother would counteract him by means of either corruption or fear. It is certain that during the sixteenth century, and the years that preceded and followed it, poisoning was brought to a perfection unknown to modern chemistry as history itself will prove. Italy, 
the cradle of modern science, was, at this period, the inventor and mistress of these secrets, many of which are now lost. Hence the reputation for that crime which weighed for the two following centuries on Italy. Romance writers have so greatly abused it that wherever they have introduced Italians into their tales, they have almost always made them play the part of assassins and poisoners. If Italy then had the traffic in subtle poisons which some historians attribute to her, we should remember her supremacy in the art of toxicology, as we do her preeminence in all other human knowledge and art in which she took the lead in Europe. The crimes of that period were not her crimes specially. She served the passions of the age, just as she built magnificent edifices, commanded armies, painted noble frescoes, sang romances, loved queens, delighted kings, devised ballets and fates, and ruled all policies. The horrible art of poisoning reached to such a pitch in Florence that a woman, dividing a peach with a duke, using a golden fruit knife with one side of its blade poisoned, ate one half of the peach herself, and killed the duke with the other. A pair of perfumed gods were known to have infiltrated mortal illness through the pores of the skin. Poison was instilled into bunches of natural roses, and the fragrance when inhaled gave death. Don John of Austria was poisoned, it was said, by a pair of boots. Charles the Ninth had good reason to be curious in the matter. We know already the dark suspicions and beliefs which now prompted him to surprise the perfumer René at his work. The old fountain at the corner of the Rue de la Brisse, which has since been rebuilt, offered every facility for the royal vagabonds to climb upon the roof of a house not far from that of René, which the king wished to visit. Charles, followed by his companions, began to ramble over the roofs to the great terror of the burghers, awakened by the tramp of these false thieves, who called to them in saucy language, listened to their talk, and even pretended to force an entrance. When the Italians saw the king and Tavan threading their way among the roofs of the house next to that of René, Albert de Gondi sat down, declaring that he was tired, and his brother followed his example. So much the better, thought the king, glad to leave his spies behind him. Tavan began to laugh at the two Florentines, left sitting alone in the midst of deep silence, in a place where they had naught but the skies above them and the cats for auditors. But the brothers made use of their position to exchange thoughts they would not dare utter to any other spot in the world, thoughts inspired by the events of the evening. Albert, said the Grand Master to the Marquis, the king will get the better of the Queen Mother by doing a foolish thing for our own interests to stay by those of Catherine. We go over to the king now, and he is searching everywhere for support against her, and for able men to serve him. We shall not be driven away like wild beasts when the Queen Mother is banished, imprisoned, or killed. You wouldn't get far with such ideas, replied the Marechal gravely. You'd follow the king into the grave, and he wouldn't live long. He is ruined by excess. Cosmo Ruggiero predicts his death within a year. The dying boars often kill the huntsmen, said Charles de Gondi. The conspiracy of the Duc d'Alencon, the King of Navarre, and the Prince de Conde, with whom La Mole and Coquenard are negotiating, is more dangerous than useful. In the first place, the King of Navarre, whom the Queen Mother hoped to catch in the very act, distrusts her and declines to run his head into the noose. He means to profit by the conspiracy without taking any of its risks. Besides, the notion now is to put the crown on the head of Duc d'Alencon, who has turned Galvanist. Baudelone. But don't you see that this conspiracy enables the Queen Mother to find out what the Huguenots can do with the Talenson and what the King can do with the Huguenots? For the King is even now negotiating with them, but he'll be finally pilloried tomorrow when Catherine reveals to him the counter conspiracy which will neutralize all his projects. Ah, explained Charles de Gondi. By dint of profiting by her advice, she's cleverer and stronger than me. Well, that's all right. All right, for the Duc d'Anjou prefers to be King of France rather than King of Poland. I am going now to explain the matter to him. When do you start, Albert? Tomorrow. I am ordered to accompany the King to Poland, and I expect to join him in Venice, where the patricians have taken upon themselves to amuse and delay him. Ah, you are prudent yourself. Get best here. I swear to you there is not the slightest danger for either of us in remaining at court. If there were, do you think I would go away? I should stay by the side of my kind mistress. Kind? explained the Grand Master. She is a woman to drop all her instruments to the moment she finds them heavy. Oh, Colleone, you pretend to be a soldier and you fear death. 
Every business has its duties, and we have ours in making our fortune. By attaching ourselves to kings, the source of all temporal power, which protects, elevates, and enriches families, we are forced to give them as devoted a love as that which bands in the hearts of matters toward heaven. We must suffer in their cause. When they sacrifice us to the interests of their throne, we may perish, for we die as much for ourselves as for them. But our name and our families perish not. Echo. You are right as to yourself, Albert, for they have given you the ancient title and duchy of the rights. Now listen to me, replied his brother. The queen hopes much from the cleverness of the Ruggieri. She expects them to bring the king once more under his control. When Charles refused to use Rene's perfumes any longer, the wary woman knew at once on whom his suspicions really rested. But who can tell the schemes that are in his mind? Perhaps he is only as hesitating as to what fate he should give his mother. He hates her, you know. He said a few words about it to his wife. She reported them to Madame de Fiesque. Madame de Fiesque told the queen mother. Since then the king has kept away from his wife. The time has come, said Charles de Gondi. To do what? asked the marechal. To lay hold of the king's mind, replied the grand master, who, if he was not so much in the queen's confidence as his brother, was by no means less clear-sighted. Charles, I have opened a great career to you, said his brother gravely. If you wish to be a duke also, be as I am, a compass and cat's paw of our mistress. Of our mistress. She is the strongest here, and she will continue in power. Madame de Sauve is on her side, and the king of Navarre and the duke d'Alencon are still for Madame de Sauve. Catherine holds the pair in a leash under Charles the Ninth, and she will hold them in future under Henri the Third. God grant that Henri may not prove ungrateful. How so? His mother is doing too much for him. Ah, what noise is that? A you in the rue saint honore cried the Grand Master. Listen, there is someone at Rennes' door. Don't you hear the footsteps of many men? Can they have arrested the Ruggieri? Ah, diavolo, this is prudence indeed. The king's has not shown his usual impetuosity. But where will they imprison him? Let us go down into the street and see. The two brothers reached the corner of the rue L'Autruche just as the king was entering the house of his mistress, Marie Touchet. By the light of the torches which the concierge carried, they distinguished Tavan and the two Ruggieri. Hey, Tavan! cried the Grand Master, running after the king's companion, who had turned and was making his way back to the Louvre. What happened to you? We fell into a nest of sorcerers and arrested two compatriots of yours, who may perhaps be able to explain to the minds of French gentlemen how you, you are not Frenchmen, have managed to lay hands on two of the chief officers of the crown, replied Tavan, half jesting, half in earnest. But the king, inquired the grand master, who cared little for Tavan's enmity, he stays with his mistress. We reached our present distinction through an absolute devotion to our masters. A noble course, my dear Tavan, which I see that you also have adopted, replied Albert de Gondi. The three courtiers walked on in silence. At the moment when they parted, on meeting their servants who had in esc- who then escorted them, two men glided swiftly along the walls of the Rue Lortouche. These men were the king and the Comte de Solern, who soon reached the banks of the Seine at a point where a boat and two rowers, carefully selected by de Solern, awaited them. In a few moments they reached the other shore. My mother has not gone to bed, cried the king. She will see us. We chose a bad place for the interview. She will think it a duel, replied Solern, and she cannot possibly distinguish who we are at this distance. At this distance. Well, let me see her, explained Charles the Ninth. I am resolved now. The king and his confidant sprang ashore and walked quickly in the direction of the Pré aux Clairs. When they reached it, the Comte de Solern, preceding the king, met a man who was evidently on the watch, and with whom he exchanged a few words. The man then retired to his distance. Presently, two other men, who seemed to be princes by the marks of respect which the first man paid to them, left the place where they were evidently hiding behind the broken fence of a field and approached the king, to whom they bent the knee. But Charles the Ninth raised them before they touched the ground, saying, No ceremony, for your old gentleman here. A venerable old man, who might have been taken for the Chancelier de l'Hôpital, had the latter not died in the preceding year, now joined the three gentlemen, all four walking rapidly so to reach a spot where their conference could not be overheard by their attendants. The Comte de Solern followed at a slight distance to keep watch over the king. That fateful servant was filled with a distrust not shared by Charles the Ninth, a man to whom life was now a burden. He was the only person on the king's side who witnessed this mysterious conference, which presently became animated. 
Sire, said one of the newcomers, the Connetable de Montmorency, the closest friend of the king your father, arrived with the Marechal de Saint Andre in declaring that Madame Catherine ought to be sewn up in a sack and flung into the river. If that had been done, then many worthy persons would still be alive. I have enough executions on my conscience, monsieur, replied the king. But, sir, said the youngest of the four personages, if you merely banish her from the depths of her exile, we and the Catherine will continue to store up strife and to find auxiliaries. We have everything to fear from the Guises, who for the last nine years have schemed for a vast Catholic alliance, in the secret of which your majesty is not included, and it threatens your throne. This alliance was invented by Spain, which will never renounce its project of destroying the boundary of the Pyrenees. Sire, Calvinism will save France by setting up a moral barrier between her and a nation which covets the empire of the world. If the Queen Mother is exiled, she will turn for help to Spain and to the Guises. Gentlemen, said the king, know this. If by your help peace without distrust is once established, I will take upon myself the duty of making all subjects tremble. Tête Dieu. It is time indeed for royalty to assert itself. My mother is right in that at any rate. You ought to know that it is to your interest as well as mine. For your hands, your fortunes depend upon our throne. If religion is overthrown, the hands you allow to do it will be laid next upon the throne and then upon you. I no longer care to fight ideas with weapons that cannot touch them. Let us now see if Protestantism will make progress when left to itself. Above all, I would like to see with whom and what the spirit of that faction will wrestle. The admiral, God rest soul, was not my enemy. He swore to me to restrain the revolt without spiritual limits and to leave the ruling of the kingdom to the monarch, his master with submissive subjects. Gentlemen, if the matter be still within your power, set that example now. Help your sovereign to put down a spirit of rebellion which takes tranquillity from each and all of us. War is depriving us of revenue. It is ruining the kingdom. I am weary of these constant troubles, so weary that if it is absolutely necessary, I will sacrifice my mother. Nay, I will go farther. I will keep an equal number of Protestants and Catholics about me, and I will hold the axe of Louis XI above their heads to force them to be on good terms. If the Monsieur de Guise plot a holy alliance to attack our crown, the executioner shall begin with their heads. I see the miseries of my people, and I will make a short work of the great lords who care little for consciences. Let them hold what opinions they like. What I want in future is submissive subjects, who will work, according to my will, for the prosperity of the state. Gentlemen, I give you ten days to negotiate with your friends, to break off your plots, and to return to me who will be your father. If you refuse, you will see changes. I shall use the mass of the people who rise at my voice against the lords. I will make myself a king who pacificates his kingdom by striking down those who are more powerful even than you and who defer and who dare defy him. If the troops fail me, I have my brother of Spain on whom I shall call to defend our ministers, and if I lack a minister to carry out my will, he can lend me the Duke of Alba. But in that case, sire, we should have Germans to oppose to your Spaniards said one of his hearers. Cousin, replied Charles the Ninth coldly, my wife's name is Elizabeth of Austria. Support might fail you on the German side, but for heaven's sake let us fight, a fight we must, alone, with the help, the help of foreigners. You are the object of my mother's hatred, and you stand nearer to me to be my second in the duel I am about to fight with. Well, then listen to what I say now. You seem to me so worthy of confidence that I offer you the post of Connetable. You will not betray me like the other. The prince, to whom Charles the Ninth had addressed himself, stuck his hand into that of the king, exclaiming, Ventre sans cri! Brother, this is enough to make me forget many wrongs. But, sire, the head cannot march without the tail, and ours is a long tail to drag. Give me more than ten days. We want at least a month to make our friends your reason. At the end of that time, we shall be masters. A month, so be it. My only negotiator will be Villeroy. Trust no one else, no matter what is said to you. One month, echoed the other seigneurs. That is sufficient. Gentlemen, we are five, said the king. Five men of honour. If any betrayal takes place, we shall know on whom to avenge it. The three strangers kissed the hand of Charles the Ninth, 
and took leave of him with every mark of the utmost respect. As the king recrossed the Seine, four o'clock was ringing from the clock tower of the Louvre. Lights were on in the queen mother's room. She had not yet gone to bed. My mother is still on the watch, said Charles de Comte de Solène. She has her forge, as you have yours, remarked the German. Dear Count, what do you think of a king who was reduced to becoming a conspirator? Charles the Ninth bitterly, after a pause. I think, sir, that if you would allow me to fling the woman into the river, as your young cousin said, France would soon be at peace. What? A parricide in addition to the Saint Bartholomew, Count? cried the king. No, no, I will exile her. Once fallen, my mother will no longer either servants or partisans. Well then, sir, replied the Comte de Solern, give me the order to arrest her at once and take her out of the kingdom, for tomorrow she will have forced you to change your mind. Come to my forge, said the king, no one can overhear us there. Besides, I don't want my mother to suspect the capture of the Rodieri. If she knows I am in my workshop, she'll suppose nothing, and we can consult about the proper measures for her arrest. As the king entered a lower room of the palace, which he used for a workshop, he caused his companion's attention to the forge and his implements with a laugh. I don't believe, he said, among all the kings of France we'll ever have, there'll be another to take pleasure in such work as that. But when I am really king, I'll forge no swords. They shall all go back into their scabbards. Sire, said the Comte de Solern, the fatigues of tennis and hunting, your toil at this forge, and if I may say, it love our chariots which the devil is offering you to get the faster to saint Anise. Solern, said the king in a piteous tone, if you knew the fire they have put into my soul and body, nothing can quench it. Are you sure of the men who are guarding the Rogieri? As sure as of myself. Very good, then. During this coming day I should take my own course. Think of the proper means of making the arrest, and when I will give you my final orders by five o'clock at Madame de Belleville's. As the first rays of dawn were struggling with the lights of the workshop, Charles the Ninth, left alone by the departure of the Comte de Solern, heard the door of the apartment turn on its hinges, and saw his mother standing within it, in the dim light like a phantom. Though very nervous and impressible, the king did not quiver, albeit under the circumstances in which he then stood, this apparition had a certain air of mystery and horror. Monsieur, she said, you are killing yourself. I am fulfilling my horoscope. I am fulfilling my horoscope, he replied with a bitter smile. But you, madame, you appear to be as early as I. We have both been up all night, monsieur, with very different intentions, while you have been conferring with your worst enemies in the open fields, concealing your axe from your mother, assisted by Tavan and the Gondis, with whom you have been scouring the town. I have been reading dispatches which contained the proofs of a terrible conspiracy, in which your brother, the Duc d'Alencon, your brother-in-law, the King of Navarre, Prince de Conde, and half the nobles of the kingdom are all taking part. Their purpose is nothing less than to take the crown from your head and seize your person. Those gentlemen have already fifty thousand good troops behind them. Bah! exclaimed the king incredulously. Your brother has turned Huguenot, she continued. My brother? Gone over to the Huguenots? cried Charles, brandishing the piece of iron which he held in his hand. Yes, the Duc d'Alencon. Huguenot at heart will soon be won before the eyes of the world. Your sister, the Queen of Navarre, has almost ceased to love you. She cares more of the Duc d'Alencon, she cares of Bussy, and she loves that little La Mole. What a heart! exclaimed the king. That little La Mole, went on the queen, wishes to make himself a great man by giving France a king of his own strength. He is promised, they say, the place of Connetable. Curse that Margot! cried the king. This is what comes of a marriage with a heretic. Heretic or not is of no consequence. The trouble is that in spite of my advice you have brought the head of the young branch to near the throne by that marriage, and Henry's purpose is now to embroil you with the rest and make you kill one another. The house of Bourbon is the enemy of the house of Valois. Remember that, monsieur, where younger branches should be kept in a state of poverty, where they are born conspirators. It is sheer folly to give them arms when they have none, or to leave them in possession of arms when they seize them. Let every younger son be made incapable of doing harm. That is the law of crowns. The sultans of Asia follow it. The proofs of this conspiracy are in my room upstairs, where I asked you to follow me last evening when you bade me good night. But instead of doing so, 
It seems you had other plans. I therefore waited for you. We do not take the proper measures immediately. You will meet the fate of Charles the Simple within a month. A month? exclaimed the king, thunderstruck. At the coincidence of that period with the delay asked for by the princes themselves. In a month we shall be masters, he said to himself, quoting their words. Madame, he said aloud, what are your proofs? They are unanswerable, monsieur. They come from my daughter Marguerite. Alarmed herself at the possibilities of such a combination, her love for the throne of Valois has proved stronger, this time than all of her other loves. She asks as the price of her revelations that nothing shall be done to La Mothe, but the scoundrel seems to me a dangerous villain, whom we had better be rid of, as well as the Comte de Coquenot, the brother d'Alencon's right hand. As for the Ponce de Conde, he consents to everything, provided I am thrown into the sea. Perhaps that is the wedding present he gives me in return for the pretty wife I gave him. Oh, this is a serious matter, monsieur. You talk of horoscopes. I know the prediction which gives the throne of the Valois to the Bourbon, and if we do not take it, it will be fulfilled. Do not be angry with your sister. She has behaved well in this affair, my son, continued the queen, after a pause, giving a tone of tenderness to her words. Evil persons on the side of the Guises are trying to sow dissensions between you and me, and yet we are the only ones in the kingdom whose interests are absolutely identical. You blame me, I know, for the saint Bartholomew. You accuse me of having forced you into it. Catholicism, monsieur, must be the bond between France, Spain, and Italy, three countries which can, by skilful management, secretly planned, be united in course of time under the house of Valois. Do not deprive yourself of such chances by loosing the court which binds the three kingdoms in the bonds of a common faith. Why should not the Valois and the Medici carry out for their own glory the scheme of Charles V, whose head failed him? Let us fling off that waste of Jean La Folle. The Medici, masters of Florence and of Rome, will force Italy to support your interests. They will guarantee you advantages by treaties of commerce and alliance which shall recognize your fiefs to Piedmont, the Milanais, and Naples, where you have rights. These, monsieur, are the reasons of the war to the death which we make against the Huguenots. Why do you force me to repeat these things? Charlemagne was wrong in advancing toward the north. France is a body whose hut is in the Gulf of Lyon, and its two arms over Spain and Italy. Therefore, she must rule the Mediterranean, that basket into which are poured all the riches of the Orient, now turned to the profit of the seigneurs of Venice, and the very teeth of Philip the Second. If the friendship of the Medici and your rights justify you in hoping for Italy, force, alliances, or possible inheritance may give you Spain. Warn the house of Austria as to this, that ambitious house to which the Guelphs sold Italy, and which is now hankering after Spain. Though your wife is that of house, humble it, clasp it so closely that you will smother it. There are the enemies of your kingdom. Thence comes help to the reformers. Do not listen to those who find their profit in causing us to disagree, and who torment your life by making you believe I am your secret enemy. Have I prevented you from having heirs? Why has your mistress given you a son, and your wife a daughter? Why have you not to-day three legitimate heirs to root out the hopes of these seditious persons? Is it I, monsieur, who am responsible for such failures? If you had an heir, would the Duc d'Alencon be now conspiring? As she ended these words, Catherine fixed upon her son the magnetic glare of a bird of prey upon its victim. The daughter of the Medici became magnificent. Her real self shone upon her face, which, like that of a gambler over the green table, glittered with vast cupidities. Charles the Ninth saw no longer the mother of one man, but, as was said of her, the mother of armies and of empires, Mater Castrotum, Mater Castrorum. Catherine had now spread wide the rings of her genius, and boldly flown to the heights of the Medici and Valois policy, tracing once more the mighty plans which terrified in earlier days her husband Henri the second and which transmitted by the genius of the medici to richelieu remain in writing among the papers of the house of bourbon but charles the ninth hearing the unusual persuasions his mother was using thought that there must be some necessity for them and he began to ask himself what could be her motive he dropped his eyes he hesitated his distrust was not lessened by his studied phrases catherine was amazed at the depths of suspicion she now beheld in her son's heart. Well, monsieur, she said, do you not understand me? What are we, you and I, 
in comparison with the eternity of royal crowns. Do you suppose me to have other designs than those that ought to actuate all royal persons to inhabit the sphere where empires are ruled? Madame, I will follow you to your cabinet. We must act. Act! cried Catherine. Let our enemies alone. Let them act. Take them red-handed, and law and justice will deliver you from their assaults. For God's sake, monsieur, show them good will. The queen withdrew. The king remained alone for a few moments, for he was utterly overwhelmed. On which side is the trap? thought he. Which of the two, she or they, deceive me? What is my best policy? Deus decerna causam meam, he muttered with tears in his eyes. Life is a burden to me. I prefer death, natural or violent, to these perpetual torments, he cried presently bringing down his hammer upon the anvil with such force that the vaults of the palace trembled. My God, he said as he went outside and looked up at the sky, thou for whose holy religion I struggle, give me the light of thy countenance that I may penetrate the secrets of my mother's heart while I question the Rogiel. End of section 19Section 20 of Catherine de' Medici by Honor de Balzac, translated by Catherine Prescott Warmly. Part 2 The Secrets of the Ruggieri. Chapter 3 Marie Touchet. The little house of Madame de Belleville, where Charles the Ninth had deposited his prisoners, was the last but one in the Rue de l'Autruche on the side of the Rue Saint Honneur. The street gate, flanked by two little brick pavilions, seemed very simple in those days, when gates and their accessories were so elaborately treated. It had two pilasters of stone cut in facets, and the coping represented a reclining woman holding a cornucopia. The gate itself, closed by enormous locks, had a wicket through which to examine those who asked admittance. In each pavilion lived a porter, for the king's extremely capricious pleasure required a porter by day and by night. The house had a little courtyard paved like those of Venice. At this period, before carriages were invented, ladies went about on horseback or in litters, so that the courtyards could be made magnificent without fear of injury from horses or carriages. This fact is always to be remembered as an explanation of the narrowness of streets, the small size of courtyards, and certain other details of the private dwellings of the 15th sixteenth centuries the house of one story only above the ground floor was capped by a sculptured frieze above which rose a roof with four sides the peak being flattened to form a platform dormer windows were cut in this roof with casings and pediments which the chisel of some great artist had covered with arabesques and dentils each of the three windows on the main floor were equally beautiful in stone embroidery which the brick of the walls showed off to great advantage on the ground floor a double portico very delicately decorated led to the entrance door which was covered with bosses cut with facets in the venetian manner a style of decoration which was further carried on round the windows placed to right and left of the door a garden carefully laid out in the fashion of the times and filled with choice flowers occupied a space behind the house equal to that of the courtyard in front a grapevine draped its walls in the centre of a grass plot rose a silver fir tree. The flower borders were separated from the grass by meandering paths, which led to an arbour of clipped yews at the farther end of the little garden. The walls were covered with a mosaic of variously coloured pebbles, coarse in design, it is true, but pleasing to the eye from the harmony of its tints with those of the flower beds. The house had a carved balcony on the garden side, above the door, and also on the front toward the courtyard and around the middle windows. On both sides of the house, the ornamentation of the principal window, which projected some feet from the wall, rose to the frieze, so that it formed a little pavilion, hung there like a lantern. The casings of the other windows were inlaid on the stone with precious marbles. In spite of the exquisite taste displayed in the little house, there was an air of melancholy about it. It was darkened by the buildings that surrounded it, and by the roofs of the Hôtel d'Alençon, which threw a heavy shadow over both court and garden. Moreover, a deep silence reigned there. 
but this silence these half-lights this solitude soothed a royal soul which could there surrender itself to a single emotion as in a cloister where men pray or in some sheltered home wherein they love it is easy now to imagine the interior charm and choiceness of this haven the sole spot in his kingdom where this dying valois could pour out his soul reveal his sufferings exercise his taste for art and give himself up to the posy he loved pleasures denied him by the cares of a cruel royalty here alone were his great soul and his high intrinsic worth appreciated here he could give himself up for a few brief months the last of his life to the joys of fatherhood pleasures into which he flung himself with the frenzy that a sense of his coming and dreadful death impressed on all his actions in the afternoon of the day succeeding the night scene we have just described marie touchet was finishing her toilette in the oratory which was the boudoir of those days she was arranging the long curls of her beautiful black hair bending them with the velvet of a new coif and gazing intently into her mirror it is nearly four o'clock that interminable council must surely be over she thought to herself jacob has returned from the louvre he says that everybody he saw was excited by the number of the councillors summoned and the length of the session what can have happened is it some misfortune good god surely he knows how suspense wears out the soul perhaps he has gone a-hunting if he is happy and amused it is all right when i see him gay i forget all i have suffered she drew her hands round her slender waist as if to smooth some trifling wrinkle in her gown turning sideways to see if its folds fell properly and as she did so she caught sight of the king on the couch behind her the carpet had so muffled the sound of his steps that he had slipped in softly without being heard you frighten me she said with a cry of surprise which was quickly repressed were you thinking of me said the king when do i not think of you she answered sitting down beside him she took off his cap and cloak passing her hands through his hair as though she combed it with her fingers charles let her do as she pleased but made no answer surprised at this marie knelt down to study the pale face of her royal master and then saw the signs of a dreadful weariness and a more consummate melancholy than any she had yet consoled she repressed her tears and kept silence that she might not irritate by mistaken words the sorrow which as yet she did not understand in this she did as tender women do under like circumstances she kissed that forehead seamed with untimely wrinkles on those livid cheeks trying to convey to the worn-out soul the freshness of hers pouring her spirit into the sweet caresses which met with no response presently she raised her head to the level of the king's clasping him softly in her arms then she lay still her face hidden on that suffering breast watching for the opportune moment to question his dejected mind my charlot she said at last will you not tell your poor distressed marie the troubles that cloud that precious brow and whiten those beautiful white lips except charlemagne he said in a hollow voice all the kings of france named charles have ended miserably pooh she said look at charles the eighth that poor prince exclaimed the king in the flower of his age he struck his head against a low door the chateau of amboise where he was having decorated and died in horrible agony it was his death which gave the crown to our family charles the seventh reconquered his kingdom darling he died the king lowered his voice of hunger for he feared being poisoned by the dauphin who had already caused the death of his beautiful agnes the father feared his son to-day the son dreads his mother why drag up the past she said hastily remembering the dreadful life of charles the sixth ah sweetest kings have no need to go to sorcerers or to discover their coming fate they need only turn to history i am at this moment endeavouring to escape the fate of charles the simple who was robbed of his crown and died in prison after seven years captivity charles v conquered the english she said triumphantly no not he but de guslin he himself poisoned by charles de navarre dragged out a wretched existence well charles the fourth then 
He married three times to obtain an heir, in spite of the masculine beauty of the children of Philippe le Bel. The first house of Valois ended with him, and the second is about to end in the same way. The queen has given me only a daughter, and I shall die without leaving her pregnant, for a long minority would be the greatest curse I could bequeath to the kingdom. Besides, if I had a son, where do he live? The name of Charles is fatal. Charlemagne exhausted the luck of it. If I left a son, I would tremble at the thought that he would be Charles the Tenth. Who is it that wants to seize your crown? My brother d'Alencon conspires against it. Enemies are all about me. Monsieur, said Marie, with a charming little pout, do tell me something gayer. Ah, my little jewel, my treasure, don't call me monsieur, even in jest. You remind me of my mother, who stabs me incessantly with that title by which she seems to snatch away my crown. She says, my son, to the Duc d'Anjou, I mean the King of Poland. Sire, exclaimed Marie, clasping her hands as though she were praying, there is a kingdom where you are worshipped. Your majesty fills it with his glory, his power, and there the word monsieur means my beloved lord. She unclasped her hands and with a pretty gesture pointed to her heart. The words were so musique, to use a word of the times which depicted the melodies of love, that Charles the Ninth caught her round the waist with the nervous force that characterized him, and seated her on his knee, rubbing his forehead gently against the pretty curls so coquettishly arranged. Marie thought the moment favourable. She ventured a few kisses, which Charles allowed rather than accepted. Then she said softly, If my servants were not mistaken, you were out all night in the streets, as in the days when you played the pranks of a younger son. Yes, replied the king, still lost in his own thoughts. Did you fight the watchman and frighten some of the burghers? Who are the men you brought here and locked up? They must be very criminal as you won't allow any communication with them. No girl was ever locked in as carefully, and they have not had a mouthful to eat since they came. The Germans whom Solern left to guard them won't let anyone go near the room. Is it a joke you are playing, or is it something serious? Yes, you are right, said the king, coming out of his reverie. Last night I did scour the rues of Tavannes and the Gondis. I wanted to try my old follies with the old companions, but my legs were not what they once were. I did not dare leap the streets, though we did jump two alleys from one roof to the next. At the second, however, Devan and I, holding on to a chimney, agreed that we couldn't do it again. If either of us had been alone, we couldn't have done it then. I'll wager that you sprang first, the king smiled. I know why you risk your life in that way. And why, you little witch? You are tired of life. Ah, sorceress, but I am being hunted down by sorcery, said the king, resuming his anxious look. My sorcery is love, she replied, smiling. Since the happy day when you first loved me, have I not always divined your thoughts? And, if you will let me speak the truth, the thoughts which torture you today are not worthy of a king. Am I a king? he said bitterly. Cannot you be one? What did Charles the Seventh do? He listened to his mistress, Monseigneur, and he reconquered his kingdom, invaded by the English as yours is now by the enemies of our religion. Your last coup d'etat showed you the course you have to follow. Exterminate heresy. You blame the Saint Pantalomew, said Charles, and now you that is over she said. Besides, I agree with Madame Catherine that it was better to do it yourselves than let the Guises do it. Charles the Seventh had only men to fight. I am face to face with ideas, resumed the king. We can kill men, but we can't kill words. The Emperor Charles V gave up the attempt. His son Philip has spent his strength upon it. We should all perish, we kings in that struggle. On whom can I rely? To right, among the Catholics, I find the Guises, who are my enemies. To left, the Calvinists, who will never forgive me the death of my poor old Coligny, nor that bloody day in August. Besides, they want to suppress the throne, and in front of me, what have I? My mother. Arrest her, when alone, said Marie in a low voice. 
whispering in his ear. I meant to do so yesterday. Today I no longer intend it. You speak of it rather coolly. Between the daughter of an apothecary and that of a doctor there is no great difference, replied Touche, always ready to laugh at the false origin attributed to her. The king frowned. Oh, you don't take such liberties. Catherine de Medici is my mother, and you ought to tremble lest what is it you fear? Poison, cried the king beside himself. Poor child, cried Marie, restraining her tears, for the sight of such strength united to such weakness touched her deeply. Ah, she continued, you make me hate Madame Catherine, who has been so good to me. Her kindness now seems perfidy. Why is she so kind to me and bad to you? During my stay in Dauphin I have many things of your ruin which you concealed from me, it seems. To me that the queen your mother is the real cause of all your troubles. In what way? cried the king, deeply interested. Women whose souls and whose intentions are pure use virtue wherewith to rule the men they love. But women who do not seek good rule men through their evil instincts. Now the queen made vices out of certain of your noblest qualities, and she taught you to believe that your worst inclinations were virtues. Was that the part of a mother? Be a tyrant like Louis the Eleventh, inspire terror, imitate Philip the Second, banish the Italians, drive out the Guises, confiscate the lands of the Calvinists. Out of this solitude you will rise a king. You will save the throne. The moment is propitious. Your brother is in Poland. We are two children at statecraft, said Charles bitterly. We know nothing except how to love. Alas, my treasure, yesterday I too thought all these things. I dreamed of accomplishing great deeds. Bah! My mother blew down my house of cards. From a distance we see great questions outlined like the summits of mountains. And it is easy to say, I'll make an end of Calvinism. I'll bring those guises to task. I'll separate from the court of Rome. I'll rely upon my people, upon the burghers. Ah, yes, from afar it all seems simple enough. But try to climb those mountains, and the higher you go, the more the difficulties appear. Calvinism in itself is the last thing the leaders of that party care for, and the Guises, those rabid Catholics, would be sorry indeed to see the Calvinists put down. Each side considers its own interests exclusively and religious opinions are but a cloak for insatiable ambition the party of charles the ninth is the feeblest of all that of the king of navarre that of the king of poland that of the duc d'alencon that of the condes that of the guises that of my mother are all intriguing one against another but they take no account of me not even in my own council my mother in the midst of so many contending elements is nevertheless the strongest among them she has just proved to me the inanity of my plans. We are surrounded by rebellious subjects who defy the law. The axe of Louis the Eleventh, of which you speak, is lacking to us. Parliament would not condemn the Guises, nor the King of Navarre, nor the Condes, nor my brother, nor the courage to assassinate is needed. The throne will be forced to strike down those insolent men who suppress both law and justice. But where can we find the faithful arm? The council I held this morning has disgusted me with everything, treason everywhere, contending interests all around me. I am tired with the burden of my crown. I only want to die in peace. He dropped into a sort of gloomy somnolence. Disgusted with everything, repeated Marie Touchet sadly, but she did not disturb the black torpor of her lover. Charles was the victim of a complete prostration of mind and body, produced by three things the exhaustion of all his faculties, aggravated by the disheartenment of realising the extent of an evil, the recognised impossibility of surmounting his weakness, and the aspect of difficulties so great that genius itself would dread them. The king's depression was in proportion to the courage and the loftiness of ideas to which he had risen during the last few months. In addition to this, an attack of nervous melancholy caused by his malady, had seized him as he left the protracted council which had taken place in his private cabinet. Marie saw that he was in one of those crises, when the least word, even of love, would be importunate and painful, so she remained kneeling quietly beside him, her head on his knee, the king's hand buried in her hair, and he himself motionless, without a word, without a sigh, 
as still as Marie herself. Charles the Ninth in the lethargy of impotence. Marie in the stupor of despair which comes to a loving woman when she perceives the boundaries at which love ends. The lovers thus remained in the deepest silence during one of those terrible hours when all reflection wounds, when the clouds of an inward tempest veil even the memory of happiness. Marie believed that she herself was partly the cause of this frightful dejection. She asked herself, not without horror, if the excessive joys and the violent love which she had never yet found strength to resist did not contribute to weaken the mind and body of the king. As she raised her eyes, bathed in tears, toward her lover, she saw the slow tears rolling down his pallid cheeks. This mark of the sympathy that united them so moved the king that he rushed from his depression like a spurred horse. He took Marie in his arms and placed her on the sofa. I will no longer be king, he cried. I will be your lover, your lover only, wholly given up to that happiness. I will die happy and not consumed by the cares and miseries of a throne. The tone of these words, the fire that shone in the half-extinct eyes of the king, gave Marie a terrible shock instead of happiness. She blamed her love as an accomplice in the malady of which the king was dying. Meanwhile, you forget your prisoners, she said, rising abruptly. Hey, what care I for them? I give them leave to kill me. What? Are they murderers? Oh, don't be frightened, little one. We hold them fast. Don't think of them, but of me. Do you love me? Sire, she cried. Sire, he repeated, sparks darting from his eyes. So violent was the rush of his anger at the untimely respect of his mistress. You are in league with my mother. Oh, God! cried Marie, looking at the picture of Alfred Prédieu, and turning toward it to say her prayer. Grant that he comprehend me. Ah, said the king suspiciously, you have some wrong to me upon your conscience. Then, looking at her from between his arms, he plunged his eyes into hers. I have heard some talk of the mad passion of a certain entregu, he went on wildly. Ever since their grandfathers, a soldier Balzac, married a vicomtesse at milan that family hold their heads too high marie looked at the king with so proud an air that he was ashamed and that instant the cries of little charles de valois who had just awakened were heard in the next room marie ran to the door come in bourguignon she said taking the child from its nurse and carrying it to the king you are more of a child than he she cried half angry half appeased he is beautiful said charles the ninth taking his son in his arms i alone know how like he is to you said marie always he has your smile and your gestures so tiny as that said the king laughing at her oh i know men don't believe such things but watch him my shallow play with him look there see am i not right true explained the king astonished by a motion of the child which seemed the very miniature of a gesture of his own ah the pretty flower cried the mother never shall he leave us he will never cause me grief the king frolicked with his son he tossed him in his arms and kissed him passionately talking the foolish unmeaning talk the pretty baby talk invented by nurses and mothers his voice grew childlike at last his forehead cleared joy returned to his saddened face and then as marie saw that he had forgotten his troubles she laid her head upon his shoulder and whispered in his ear won't you tell me shallow why have you made me keep murderers in my house who are these men and what do you mean to do with them in short i want to know what you were doing on the roofs i hope there was no woman in the business then you love me as much as ever cried the king meeting the clear interrogatory glance that women know so well how to cast upon occasion you doubted me she replied as a tear shone on her beautiful eyelashes. There are women in my adventure, said the king, but they are sorceresses. How far had I told you? You are on the roofs nearby. What street was it? Rue sur la Nord, sweetest, said the king, who seemed to have recovered himself. Collecting his thoughts, he began to explain to his mistress what had happened, as if to prepare her for a scene that was presently to take place in her presence. As I was passing through the street last night on a frolic, he said, I chanced to see a bright light from the dormer window of the house 
occupied by Rene, my mother's glover and perfumer, and once yours. I have strong doubts about that man and what goes on in his house. If I am poisoned, the dog will come from there. I shall dismiss him tomorrow. Ah, so you kept him after I had given him up, cried the king. I thought my life was safe with you, he added gloomily. But no doubt death is following me even here. But, my dearest, I have only just returned from Dauphin without Dauphin, she said, smiling. And Rene has supplied me with nothing since the death of the Queen of Navarre. Go on, you climb to the roof of Rene's house. End of section 20《セクション21 of Catherine de Medici by Honor de Balzac, translated by Catherine Prescott Warmly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 2 The Secrets of the Ruggieri, Chapter 4 The King's Tale. Yes, returned the king. In a second I was there, followed by Tavan, and when we clambered to a spot where I could see without being seen the interior of that devil's kitchen, in which I beheld extraordinary things, which inspired me to take certain measures. Did you ever notice the end of the roof of that cursed perfumer? The windows toward the street are always closed and dark, except the last, from which can be seen the Hôtel de Soissons and the observatory which my mother built for that astrologer Cosmo Ruggiero. Under the roof are lodging rooms and a gallery which have no windows except on the courtyard so that in order to see what was going on within, it was necessary to go where no man before ever dreamed of climbing, along the coping of a high wall which adjoins the roof of Rene's house. The men who set up in the house, the furnaces by which they distilled death, reckoned on the cowardice of Parisians to save them from being overlooked, but they little thought of Charles de Valois. I crept along the coping until I came to a window against the casing of which I was able to stand up straight with my arm around a carved monkey which ornamented it. "'What did you see, dear heart?' said Marie, trembling. "'A den, where works of darkness were being done,' replied the king. "'The first object on which my eyes lighted was a tall old man seated in a chair with a magnificent white beard, like that of old L'Hôpital, and dressed like him in a black velvet robe.' On his broad forehead, furrowed deep with wrinkles, on his crown of white hair, on his calm, attentive face, pale with toil and vigils, fell the concentrated rays of a lamp from which shone a vivid light. His attention was divided between an old manuscript, the parchment of which must have been centuries old, and two lighted furnaces on which heretical compounds were cooking. Neither the floor nor the ceiling of the laboratory could be seen because of the myriads of hanging skeletons, bodies of animals, dried plants, minerals, and articles of all kinds that masked the walls, while on the floor were books, instruments for distilling, chests filled with utensils for magic and astrology. In one place I saw all scoops and nativities, files, wax figures under spells, and possibly poisons. Devin and I were fascinated, I do assure you, by the sight of this devil's arsenal, only to see it put one under a spell, and if I had not been king of France, I might have been awed by it. You can tremble for both of us, I whispered to Tavan. But Tavan's eyes were already caught by the most mysterious feature of the scene. On a couch near the old man lay a girl of strangest beauty, slender and long like a snake, white as ermine, livid as death, motionless as a statue. Perhaps it was a woman just taken from her grave, on whom they were trying experiments for she seemed to wear a shroud. Her eyes were fixed, and I could not see that she breathed. The old fellow paid no attention to her. I looked at him so intently that after a while his soul seemed to pass into mine. By dint of studying him, I ended by admiring the glance of his eye. So keen, so profound, so bold in spite of the chilling power of age. I admired his mouth, mobile with thoughts emanating from a desire which seemed to be the solitary desire of his soul and was stamped upon every line of the face all things in that man expressed a hope which nothing discouraged and nothing could check his attitude a quivering immovability those outlines so free 
carved by a single passion as by the chisel of a sculptor that idea concentrated on some experiment criminal or scientific that seeking man in quest of nature thwarted by her bending but never broken under the weight of its own audacity which it would not renounce threatening creation with a fire derived from it ah all that held me in a spell for the time being i saw before me an old man who was more of a king than i for his glance embraced the world and mastered it i will forge swords no longer i will soar above the abysses of existence like that man for his science methinks is true royalty yes i believe in occult science you the eldest son the defender of the holy catholic apostolic and roman church said marie what happened to you go on go on i will fear for you and you will have courage for me looking at a clock the old man rose continued the king he went out i don't know where but i heard the window on the side toward the rue saint honore open soon a brilliant light gleamed out upon the darkness then i saw in the observatory of the hotel de soissons another light replying to that of the old man and by it i beheld the figure of gosmo Ruggieri on the tower see the communicate i said to devin who from that moment thought the matter frightfully suspicious and agreed with me that we ought to seize the two men and search incontinently their accursed workshop but before proceeding to do so we wanted to see what was going to happen after about fifteen minutes the door opened and cosmo rogier my mother's counsellor the bottomless pit which holds the secrets of the court he from whom all women ask help against their husbands and lovers and all the men ask help against their unfaithful wives and mistresses he who traffics on the future as on the past receiving pay with both hands who sells horoscopes and is supposed to know all things that semi-devil came in saying to the old man good day to you brother with him he brought a hideous old woman toothless humpback twisted bent like a chinese image only worse she was wrinkled as a withered apple her skin was saffron coloured her chin bit her nose her mouth was a mere line scarcely visible her eyes were like the black spots on a dice her forehead emitted bitterness her hair escaped in staggering grey locks from a dirty coif she walked with a crutch she smelt of heresy and witchcraft the sight of her actually frightened us tavern and me we didn't think her a natural woman god never made a woman so fearful as that she sat down on a stool near the pretty snake with whom devin was in love the two brothers paid no attention to the old woman nor to the young woman who together made a horrible couple on the one side life in death on the other death in life ah my sweet poet cried marie kissing the king good day cosmo replied the old alchemist and they both looked into the furnace what strength has the moon to-day asked the elder but caro lorenzo replied my mother's astrologer the september tides are not over we can learn nothing while that disorder lasts what says the east to-night it discloses in the air a creative force which returns to earth all that earth takes from it the conclusion is that all things here below are the product of a slow transformation but that all diversities are the forms of one and the same substance that is what my predecessor thought replied lorenzo this morning bernard palissy told me that metals were the result of compression and that fire which divides all also unites all fire has the power to compress as well as to separate that man has genius though i was placed where it was impossible for them to see me cosmo said lifting the hand of the dead girl some one is near us who is it the king she answered i at once showed myself and rapped on the window rogiero opened it and i sprang into that hellish kitchen followed by tavannes yes the king i said to the two florentines who seemed terrified in spite of your furnaces and your books your sciences and your sorceries you did not foresee my visit i am very glad to meet the famous lorenzo Ruggiero, of whom my mother speaks mysteriously i said addressing the old man who rose and bowed you are in this kingdom without my consent my good man for whom are you working here 
you whose ancestors from father to son have been devoted in heart to the house of medici listen to me you dive into so many purses that by this time if you are grassing me you have piled up gold you are too shrewd and cautious to cast yourself imprudently into criminal actions but nevertheless you are not here in this kitchen without a purpose yes you have some secret scheme you are satisfied neither by gold nor power whom do you serve god or the devil what are you concocting here i choose to know the whole truth i am a man who can hear it and keep silence about your enterprise however blamable it may be therefore you will tell me all without reserve if you deceive me you will be treated severely bacons or christians calvinists or mohammedans you have my royal word that you shall leave the kingdom in safety if you have any misdemeanours to relate i shall leave you for the rest of the night and the forenoon of tomorrow to examine your thoughts for you are now my prisoners and you will at once follow me to a place where you will be guarded carefully before obeying me the two italians consulted each other by a subtle glance then lorenzo roggiore said i might be assured that no torture could wring their secrets from them but in spite of their apparent feebleness neither pain nor human feelings had any power of them confidence alone could make their mouth say what their mind contained i must not he said be surprised if they treated as equals with a king who recognized god only as above him for their thoughts came from god alone they therefore claimed from me as much confidence and trust as they should give to me but before engaging themselves to answer me without reserve they must request me to put my left hand into that of the young girl lying there and my right into that of the old woman not wishing them to think i was afraid of their sorcery i held up my hands lorenzo took the right cosmo took the left and each placed a hand in that of each woman so that i was like jesus christ between the two thieves during the time that the two witches were examining my hands cosmo held a mirror before me and asked me to look into it his brother meanwhile was talking with the two women in a language unknown to me neither tavan nor i could catch the meaning of a single sentence before bringing them in here we put seals on all the outlets of the laboratory which Tavan undertook to guard until such time as by my express order bernard pellissy and chapelain my physician could be brought there to examine thoroughly the drugs the place contained and which were evidently made there in order to keep the rogieri ignorant of this search and to prevent them from communicating with a single soul outside i put the two devils in your law rooms in charge of solens germans who are better than the walls of a jail René, the perfumer, is kept under guard in his own house by Solène's equerry, and so are the two witches. Now, my sweetest, inasmuch as I hold the keys of the whole cabal, the kings of Thun, the chiefs of sorcery, the gypsy fortune-tellers, the masters of the future, the heirs of all past soothsayers, I intend by their means to read you, to know your heart, and together we will find out what is to happen to us i should be glad if they can lay my hand bare before you said marie without the slightest fear i know why sorcerers don't frighten you because you are a witch yourself will you have a peach she said offering him some delicious fruit on a gold plate see these grapes these pears i went to vincent myself and gathered them for you yes i'll eat them there is no poison there except a filter from your hands you ought to eat a great deal of fruit charles it would cool your blood which you heat by such excitements must i love you less perhaps so she said if the things you love injure you and i have feared it i shall find strength in my heart to refuse them i adore charles more than i love the king i want the man to live released from the tortures that make him grieve royal has ruined me yes she replied if you are only a poor prince like your brother-in-law of navarre without a penny possessing only a miserable little kingdom in spain where he never sets his foot and bern in france which doesn't give him revenue enough to feed him i should be happy much happier than if i were really queen of france but you are more than the queen of france she has king charles for the sake of the kingdom only royal marriages are only politics marie smiled and made a pretty little grimace as she said yes yes i know that sire and my sonnet have you written it dearest verses are as difficult to write as treaties of peace but you shall have them soon 
Ah, me, life is so easy here. I wish I might never leave you. However, we must send for those Italians and question them. That you. I thought one Ruggiero in the kingdom was one too many, but it seems there are two. Now listen, my precious. You don't lack sense. You would make an excellent lieutenant of police, for you can penetrate things. But, sire, we women suppose all we fear, and we turn what is probable into truth. That is the whole of our art in a nutshell. Well, help me to sound these men. Just now all my plans depend on the result of their examination. Are they innocent? Are they guilty? My mother is behind them. I hear Jacob's voice in the next room, said Marie. Jacob was the favourite valet of the king, and the one who accompanied him on all his private excursions. He now came to ask if it was the king's good pleasure to speak to the two prisoners. The king made a sign in the affirmative, and the mistress of the house gave her orders. Jacob, she said, clear the house of everybody, except the nurse and Monsieur le Dauphin d'Auvergne, who may return. As for you, stay in the lower hall, but first close the windows, draw the curtains of the salon, and light the candles. The king's impatience was so great that while these preparations were being made, he sat down upon a raised seat at the corner of a lofty fireplace of white marble, in which a bright fire was blazing, placing his pretty mistress by his side. His portrait framed in velvet was over the mantel in place of a mirror. Charles the Ninth rested his elbow on the arm of the seat, as if to watch the two Florentines the better under cover of his hand. The shutters closed and the curtains drawn, Jacob lighted the wax tapers in a tall candelabrum of chiselled silver, which he placed on the table where the Florentines were to stand. An object, by the by, which they would readily recognise as the work of their compatriot, Benvenuto Cellini. The richness of the room, decorated in the taste of Charles the Ninth, now shone forth. The red-brown of the tapestries showed to better advantage than by daylight. The various articles of furniture, delicately made or carved, reflected in the ebony panels, the glow of the fire and the sparkle of the lights. Gilding, soberly applied, shone here and there like eyes, brightening the brown colour which prevailed in this nest of love. Jacob presently gave two knocks, and, receiving permission, ushered in the Italians. Marie Touchet was instantly affected by the grandeur of Lorenzo's presence, which struck all those who met him, great and small alike. The silvery whiteness of the old man's beard was heightened by a robe of black velvet. His brow was like a marble dome. His austere face, illumined by two black eyes, which cast a pointed flame, conveyed an impression of genius issuing from solitude and all the more effective because its power had not been dulled by contact with men. It was like the steel of a blade that had never been fleshed. As for Cosmo Ruggiero, he wore the dress of a courtier of the time. Marie made a sign to the king to assure him that he had not exaggerated his description, and to thank him for having shown her these extraordinary men. I would like to have seen these sorceresses too, she whispered in his ear. End of section 21